Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Frost. Dr. Andy Bondi and I are the two co-founders of Pyramid Educational Consultants and creators of the Picture Exchange Communication System. This presentation offers an overview about the Picture Exchange Communication System, known throughout the world as PECS. We will review how a clear focus on functional communication skills is coupled with highly effective teaching strategies to provide a system that has helped thousands of children and adults improve their communication skills. We will review the six key phases within the PECS protocol and discuss issues related to transitioning from PECS to other modalities, including speech or a speech generating device. We then will note some of the myths and misconceptions that unfortunately may be associated with the use of PECS. Finally, we will briefly review some exciting new research about the effectiveness of PECS. PECS is an approach that teaches early communication skills using pictures. PECS addresses the core communication difficulty faced by individuals with autism who are not using speech as their primary modality for communicating. This deficit relates to the limited responsivity to social interactions or social re reinforcers, which can severely limit the range of communication skills learners develop. The first PECS lesson relates to the immediate wants and needs of the individual. What are the important reinforcers for each person and how can they get those items and activities in a calm, communicative fashion? In the beginning of PECS training, we teach users to exchange rather than point to a picture. The exchange is crucial because it ensures that the user is interacting with the communicative partner. We also describe several strategies that promote rapid acquisition of spontaneous communication. That is, we want the user to initiate the communicative interaction and not communicate only in response to prompts or cues by their communicative partner. PEX has become very popular over the past 20 years. There are now over 350,000 copies of the PEX manual in nine different languages in circulation around the world. The first publications about PECS were in 1992 and 1994. Since that time, nearly 90 additional publications and reports have appeared in over 15 different countries. Most of the studies on PECS have addressed single case designs or case descriptions. But there are also several group and controlled group studies as well. Studies have addressed issues related to, the, to PECS use itself, the co-development of speech in many users, behavioral improvements noted regarding many users, as well as issues concerning reliability of implementation by professionals and parents. Furthermore, there are at least six recent articles that simply review the existing literature regarding PECS. With over 25 publications appearing within the last two and a half years, it isn't easy to keep up with all the new information. The best way you can do this is by visiting our website, pex.com and finding the link on current research. This area is updated several times a year and includes abstracts on every publication of which we are aware. In order to implement PEX effectively, educators and parents must be able to use effective educational strategies. Many years ago, while heading a statewide school program for students with autism, Andy developed the Pyramid Approach to Education in order to guide the design of effective educational environments within school, home, and community settings. The Pyramid combines an emphasis upon functional communication and the best evidence-based strategies within the field of applied behavior analysis. Without the skillful use of the elements of the pyramid, it is unlikely that a child or adult will learn to use PECS effectively. Andy chose the form of a pyramid as a visual guide to this process because of the interdependency of all the components and in order to remind us that building a stable pyramid starts with a firm foundation. Within the pyramid, the foundation of our educational model is our assumption that the why of behavior, that is, why behavior occurs and changes, is grounded by the development of a science of behavior. We believe that rather than being random and chaotic, behavior is systematically related to things in the world. At times, though, behavior will be remarkably difficult to understand. Determining why a particular behavior has occurred is not always easy. Nonetheless, we maintain an attitude that determining the variables that control behavior is possible. 
Once we understand that the strategies for creating or building effective teaching environments is based on the science of learning, we then tackle issues related to what to teach. The four elements in this area involve the four base struts of the pyramid form. The first element addresses functional activities and materials, incorporating lessons that teach skills critical to the learner's immediate and next environment. In other words, how will the skills we teach today be of use to the individual in his or her current or upcoming situations, and what materials are most useful in teaching these skills? Next, we look at various motivational issues by planning for the use of powerful reinforcement systems. Herein, we rely on simple principles such as using a reinforcer-first strategy and visual reinforcement systems. Next, we consider whether we need to teach or refine certain critical functional communication skills. We will go into more depth on this issue in a moment, but our goal is to teach communication skills that are critical for optimal independence. Finally, and only after these first three elements are in place, we look at factors connected to challenging behaviors, or what we refer to as contextually inappropriate behavior. In this, our primary focus is on determining why a particular behavior is occurring or how it is functionally related to the surrounding events. Once we determine this, we then teach a replacement behavior that serves the same function. We refer to this as a functionally equivalent alternative behavior. Once the base elements are in place, we then look at various factors related to how to teach. These elements, again, are based on well-established practices in the field of applied behavior analysis. We plan for generalization before we teach our first lesson. We identify whether the type of skill we are teaching is a discrete or a sequential lesson, and whether it will be student-initiated or teacher or parent-initiated. We identify specific prompting or shaping strategies best suited to the type of skill we are teaching, and again, before we teach the first lesson, we have a plan in place for eliminating prompts so that the new skill or behavior in re occurs in response to natural cues rather than teacher prompts. We plan for error correction strategies that will lead to rapid skill acquisition. Finally, the entire model rests upon our use of data collection and analysis because we know there are no perfect lessons. We must monitor whether each student is learning and, if not, plan to modify the lesson in a systematic fashion. Let's focus our attention on the issue of communication. What is it? First, we do not believe that all behaviors are communicative. If I pick up a cup and drink some water, I have simply manipulated something in the environment and arranged for my own reinforcer, the water. There is no communication in this act because I can do it while alone just as, I, as well as I can do it in a group of people. On the other hand, if I let someone else know I want water and that person gives me the water, then we can define that act as an act of communication. Simply stated, communication requires at least two people. One directs some action towards another person, and that second person provides some type of reinforcer. We define the speaker as the one directing an action to someone else, and the listener as the one who provides the reinforcement. To illustrate this, take a look at the play area you might see in a classroom, school, or child care center. A young girl can approach the play area, see a doll she wants, and reach for and get the doll. Using our definition of communication, we would say that she did not communicate. If someone stands between her and the doll, she can do several things to still gain access to the doll. She can push that person aside and get the doll on her own. This again would not be communication. Or she can do something to that person that would cause him to give her the doll. That would be communication. She can do several things. She can speak to him, gesture to him, sign to him, give him a picture, any of these actions would be communicative. If she merely points to a picture on the wall, this might not involve communication because she may not be doing something to another person. Only when she does something directly to another can we safely identify that functional communication has occurred. What are some of the advantages of using PECs? First, the system immediately requires a user to interact with another person. 
Pointing to a picture does not assure that the action is directed toward another person, so the element that makes PEX unique is that the user is required to interact with the listener or communicative partner by approaching that person and giving him a picture. Next, the early phases of PEX focus on having the learner initiate the interaction. She does not need to wait until someone asks, what do you want? PEX also begins by focusing on requesting, or manding, in Skinner's terminology, rather than commenting or tacting. This strategy will help rapid acquisition because for many students, especially those with autism, material reinforcers are more powerful than social rewards. Finally, all the phases and changes within the PEX protocol are based upon the analysis of language offered by B.F. Skinner in his book Verbal Behavior. While it is not necessary to use or fully understand his analysis, it's useful to know that the components of PECs are based upon such a well-founded behavioral analysis. The PECs protocol involves six distinct phases. The goal in phase one of PECs is to teach the how to communicate or how to approach people to initiate communication. The sequence the student learns is to pick up a picture, reach to the communicative partner, and release the picture into the communicative partner's hand. We start with a single picture between the student and the person holding the item. In other words, picture discrimination is not a prerequisite for beginning pecs. The student does not need to know the meaning of the picture. This is similar to what we observe in typical language development. Children learn how to communicate with mom and dad long before they can say distinct words. Later, we will teach the meaning of the picture using various discrimination strategies. Several elements make this first lesson successful. First, the initial item the student requests or exchanges a picture for is a highly preferred item or what we call a powerful reinforcer. Next, the student has been without that item long enough to be willing to put effort into regaining access to it. What we teach the student is that giving a picture is an easy, stress-free way to get desired items from people. Finally, the training strategy we developed within the PECS protocol, called the two-person prompting procedure, ensures that the student learns to exchange the picture spontaneously. This procedure separates the roles of the communicative partner and the prompter. We use no verbal prompting to teach this. Rather, when the communicative partner offers the desired item and the student reaches for it, a second trainer, the physical prompter, physically guides the student to pick up, reach, and release the picture. This step assures that the child is both motivated to get the item and has initiated a response. The moment the picture touches the communicative partner's hand, the reinforcer is given immediately to the child. The communicative partner names the item while giving it. Over a series of successive trials, the physical prompter reduces the physical assistance using a backward chaining strategy. That is, first eliminating prompts to release the picture, then to reach with the picture, and finally to pick up the picture. When powerful reinforcers are used and staff are skilled at using the two-person prompting procedure, this first phase of PEX is mastered within a short time. Our experience is backed by research showing that attempting to try this phase using only one trainer very likely will lead to prompt dependency and thus a much lower chance of rapidly acquiring independent exchanges. Watch this video of a young girl who loves to dance to music. This is her very first PEX lesson. Her two teachers do a wonderful job of enticing her with the music player, waiting for an initiation, prompting her to exchange the picture, and then systematically eliminating the prompts.
was fantastic PEX training. We believe that you and your students should be having just as much fun with your lessons. The students don't have to sit, make eye contact, or demonstrate quiet hands. The first lesson should take place where the preferred items are, in the kitchen, on the playground, in a classroom, wherever the student likes his particular items. Note that some aspects of this phase le one lesson are structured. The communicative partner is immediately in front of the child, showing something that is desired. A single picture is between the student and the communicative partner. Over time, the communicative partner moves further from the child, turns away from the student, moves into the next room, and removes all attention from the child. We use shaping to systematically ensure that the student can travel further and further to get the communicative partner's attention. We provide each student with a PEX book, and at this early stage of training, we arrange for the picture of the item the student currently wants to be on the front of the book. The student learns to carry his book with him and to take it from room to room. These and other changes are made gradually so that generalization of the use of PECs is learned very early in the teaching process. Other factors within Phase 2 include using PECs with different people, including peers and siblings, in different settings within the school and at home and in the community, and using PECs with a wide variety of reinforcers, not simply at snack time and at lunch time. It's our responsibility to assure that the student will use PECs in all situations with everyone possible. The next step within the PECs protocol involves teaching simple discrimination. Many people mistakenly begin discrimination training by showing the student several pictures of desired items all at once. The problem with beginning with this approach is that some students quickly see that every picture is a good one to use. No matter what I give my teacher, she gives me something I like. Instead, it's more effective to begin with a sharp distinction between two choices, something the student really likes versus something that is not at all reinforcing. In this example, a student loves to play with the Rainmaker toy but has no use for the funnel. When given this choice, we can readily anticipate what the student truly wants. That helps us provide immediate feedback on the selection, that is, touching the picture of the rainmaker. If the student makes an error, she gives the funnel picture, we use the four-step error correction procedure, a strategy developed by Andy that ensures that the student independently exchanges the correct picture rather than a picture that the teacher shows him to exchange. After a user has mastered discriminating between various pairs of high versus non-preferred items, we start the next lesson. 
In Phase 3B, we will teach the user to make selections between items that may be equally desired. For example, if a girl loves both bananas and apples, how will we know precisely which one she wants right now? Or, as in this slide, a student sees several of his favorite toys. Which one does he truly want at this moment? In these cases, we cannot read the mind of the student. We can't tell ahead of time which he will choose. Therefore, when he gives us a picture, we simply say something like, go ahead, take it, here, and see what happens. If the student reaches for the item that corresponds with the picture he gave us, we happily allow access to the item. We call this procedure a correspondence check. In other words, we periodically check whether the picture the student gives us corresponds to what he then takes. If the student tries to take the item that does not correspond, we again use the four-step error correction procedure. At Pyramid, we often are asked to help with students who are having difficulty learning discrimination. In our experience with thousands of students using PECS, the most common reason for dis difficulty with discrimination is careless training. The person teaching PECS is not using appropriate prompting, reinforcement, or error correction strategies. So if you encounter a student having difficulty with discrimination, make sure the fidelity of treatment is in place. The next lesson within PEX, Phase 4, teaches the user to construct a simple sentence. We continue to focus on the function of requesting, but now add a new step for the user. We teach him to create sentences with an I want sentence starter picture, plus the picture of what is desired. Please note that the I want sentence starter is a single picture. There would be no meaning at this point by trying to separate the word I and want because the student most likely has not learned the concept of I versus you, he, she, or other people. Using a sentence starter and the sentence strip are important steps building toward future lessons when the student learns to use additional sentence starters to construct longer and longer sentences. In this phase four, the student learns a short sequence of steps and our preferred teaching strategy is to use backward chaining. The student first learns that rather than exchanging a single picture, he now puts that picture on a sentence strip already containing the I want picture and then exchanges the entire sentence strip. The student then learns to construct the entire sentence strip by putting the I want picture on the left side of the strip, the picture of the desired item on the right side, and then exchange the entire sentence strip. In this video, you'll see a very young boy in his daily routine upon waking. You will see him carrying his own communication book down the stairs and into the kitchen. Once in the kitchen, you'll see him communicating with a sentence strip. Put some butter. Chrissy, do it. Chrissy, do it. Don't pick the seeds out. With a knife. 
Ready? Mmm, yummy. Should we cut it? Cut. Cut. Cut this one. Good boy. Oops! Oh no, we got butter on it. Oh no! Can you wipe it off? Good boy. Thank you. Lovely. All nice and clean. Where was we? I want. You missed something. I want marmite. That's it. Bread and butter. There's the marmite. <laughs> Good boy, you do that. <gasps> oh, too much, Chrissy, too much. Little bit, look, little bit. Wipe it. I want to drink. She'll drink. I want to drink. You want more drink? Okay. Thank you. Notice what a great teacher his mother is. This is not school. Rather, his mother creates effective lessons while engaging in important functional activities such as eating breakfast, spreading, and cutting. And although this young boy did not speak, he was really an excellent communicator. Once a user has learned to construct simple sentences, Peck's training continues along two different paths. On one pathway is moving on into phase five and six lessons. The other involves teaching the user to make very specific requests. The student learns to ask for items according to attributes that are important from his perspective. For example, Andy and I like two different kinds of cookies. My favorite is a decadent chocolate cookie. Andy's favorite is a butter cookie. So if we were asking for cookies, we would need to be very specific about what kind of cookie we want. I could ask for a brown cookie, and Andy could ask for a yellow cookie. So we begin to teach attributes by first paying attention to features of reinforcing items that appear important to our students. For example, if we hold a handful of colored candies out to a student, we may notice that she picks out all the red ones. What does this tell us about the student? It tells us that she sees the difference between red candies and candies of different colors. She may not be able to ask for red or respond to us when we ask her to give us the red one, but these communication skills depend upon first responding to the color as a feature. So we have found it much easier to teach these concepts within PECS because the motivation is so strong for the student. It's more fun to ask for and get a red candy when red is the per preferred flavor than it is to touch red during a lesson with six different colored blocks. 
Students who learn to ask for items using descriptive words have a great advantage when they want something they don't have a picture of. They can describe what they want. Phase 5 addresses an issue that may still remain. Within each of the first four phases, the user has always initiated the requests. In other words, they haven't been hearing, what do you want? However, we do expect students to learn to appropriately respond to this question, so in Phase 5, we teach the student to answer the question, what do you want? This is one more important step leading up to Phase 6. The final phase in the PECS protocol teaches commenting. It's important to remember that the reinforcer for commenting is simply the social reaction by the communicative partners. When a little boy comments, I see the train, he does not end up with the train. His dad says, yes, it's a very long train. We begin teaching commenting by introducing a new sentence starter. If a student likes noises, I might start with the I hear sentence starter. If he likes to look at things, I might start with the I see sentence starter. In order to create effective commenting lesson, we need to grab the student's attention. We do this by creating events that are dramatic or surprising. Nothing is more boring than trying to get a student to name the 10 items you've placed on a tabletop. When we begin phase six with students who are not strongly motivated by social consequences or reactions, we anticipate that the first comment will not be spontaneous, but will be in response to a direct question. We begin by building upon what the student learned in phases four and five, using a sentence starter and responding to a question. So we start by asking the question that corresponds to the new sentence starter we've chosen. That is, we start by asking, what do you see or what do you hear? Over time, we gradually eliminate the question and try to promote spontaneous commenting. This last skill may be difficult for some individuals with autism, so be patient. PECS users also will need to learn to discriminate between what do you want versus what do you see and additional commenting questions. They will need to use the appropriate sentence starter for each communicative function. So, once a student completes all six phases of PECS, he will have learned to request spontaneously, to request responsively, and to comment spontaneously and comment responsively, and to do all of this using a variety of attributes. We can continue to add more lessons within these final phases to teach the student longer sentences, use of a variety of grammatical forms, and a comprehensive vocabulary. Many individuals begin using PECs when they have no spoken words. A common observation is the co-development of speech accompanying PECS use, especially in the younger children. A common question becomes, when should we stop using PECS and rely only on speech? We think the best way to answer this question is by asking the PECS user. While we never take pictures away from a student as a way to control their communication with us, we systematically evaluate how a student performs with and without PECS. In this video, you will see a young girl who has learned to ask for eggs because they can contain wonderful things. Her teacher shows her and shakes several of the eggs. The student has learned that if she uses a very specific request, she will get a full egg rather than an empty egg. The young girl knows how to ask for an egg in order to get the candy or the toys that are inside the eggs. She initially does not have access to her PECS book. Watch her and listen to her speech. Next, we saw what she did once she had access to her PECS book. 
What is this girl telling us? Without access to her picture, she did speak. She said egg several times. It wasn't clear, though, that she was talking to her teacher. However, once she had access to her pictures, she constructed a complex sentence strip, approached the teacher, and said, I want one big blue egg. It's clear that if we want her to display complex communication skills, she needs access to her pictures. To deny her access to them would be unethical. So how do we determine if a user no longer benefits from PECs? We have identified five critical questions that relate to transitioning from any one modality to another one. For example, going from PECs to speech. Number one, can the user say as many as words as can be used in PECs? Second, can the user initiate with speech as often as when using PECs? Third, is the mean length of utterance, the MLU, just as long and complex with speech as it is with PECs? And fourth, can an untrained or novel listener understand at least 80% of what is being said? And fifth, when we are transitioning to a speech-generating device in particular, in addition to assuring that numbers 1 through 4 are in place, pay very careful attention to how much time it will take the user to deliver a message. Sometimes the SGD is quicker, but many times, especially with dynamic screen displays, the time involved to move between several screens to generate a message identical to the one on the sentence strip is quite long. If the answer to any of these five criteria is no, and yet PEX is removed, then essentially we would be taking skills away from the student, and that is simply unethical. No professional would advocate taking skills away from someone, Consider this. Would you ever tape the mouth of a student shut either to get him to stop nagging or as a way to encourage the use of a different modality? Would you ever tie the fingers of a student who signs in attempt to encourage more speech? The answer to that is obviously no, and thus no one should take away pictures from those using PECs as a way to encourage the use of any other modality. Transitions are possible, but they must be done systematically. Let's take a look at some of the research findings regarding PECs. Our first publication about PECs were in the early 1990s. As we noted earlier, there has been a virtual explosion of research involving PECs use and PECs training. In general, there is growing support indicating that PECs use facilitates the acquisition and expanded use of speech, often is associated with improvements in various social skills, including factors related to joint action routines, and often is associated with improvements in behavior management concerns. Research also supports that users can create novel sentences with their pictures to describe new items, children can use PECs with their peers and siblings, and that parents and paraprofessionals can faithfully implement the protocol. In part because of the popularity of PECs around the world, there are a number of myths and misconceptions about PECs. First, the acronym PECs has become somewhat generic. Thus, some people seem to believe that any use of pictures is PECs. As you've seen in this short talk, PECs is an alternative or augmentative form of communication that people use to communicate with others. It's an expressive form of communication. As its name specifies, PECs involves the exchange of a picture. Picture point systems are not PECs. People who use PECs are spontaneous communicator. If a student relies upon someone saying, what do you want, or go get your pictures, that's not PECs. Of course, pictures can be used to help people better understand us. That is, we can use pictures to teach direction following. But such a use of pictures is not PECs, nor is the use of pictures within a schedule equivalent to PECs. Yes, we think it's a very good idea for children and adults to have visual aids with regard to schedule use and even transitions, but in these situations, the parent or teacher is showing a picture for the user to respond to. That also is not PECs. Remember, PECs is an expressive form of communication. Another myth is that PECs is only helpful for those who have no speech at all. Some people assume that if and only if a person does not speak would we consider PECs. This is a serious misperception because it ignores that PECs may serve an augmentative function for many users. That is, while using PECs, a student might speak more words, initiate more frequently, or use more complex sentence structure. 
Some people believe that PAX is only appropriate for young children. However, both our direct experience and examples within the literature demonstrate that teenagers and adults also can effectively learn to use PAX. Another myth is that PAX only teaches users to request favored items. While the early phases of PAX do focus on the request or manned function, we strongly encourage you to work on the later phases of the protocol to assure that attributes and commenting skills also are addressed. Perhaps the biggest fear associated with PECS is that if a student uses it, he or she will not learn to speak or might even stop using what little speech he or she has. In over 20 years of experience, we have never seen this fear materialize. We are not aware of any cases in which PECS use interfered with speech acquisition or production. In over 40 years of looking into this question with a wide array of modalities and systems, the broad field of alternative augmentative communication has not documented this negative outcome. Rather, all of the current research shows that the use of PECS and other AAC strategies improves the likelihood of speech development and expansion. Finally, perhaps because PECS was developed with young children with autism, some people think it is only useful for those with autism. Again, both our experience and many examples in the literature demonstrate that people with a wide variety of disabilities that impact on communication will benefit from the use of PECS. I've used PECS with a boy who was 16 months old and also with a man who was 77 years old. In terms of research, we'd like to offer a glimpse into a very exciting recent study. At this point in time, the full description is in preparation for publication. Dr. Laura Schreibman presented a paper at an autism conference a couple of years ago, and we're basing this description on her talk. She and several of her colleagues have developed a behaviorally-based intervention package in autism called Pivotal Response Training, or PRT. There are over 20 years of substantial research supporting the effectiveness of this package with young children with autism. Central to this approach is its emphasis on promoting speech from the very start of intervention. They have recently concluded a study in which 39 children with autism, a mean age of two and a half years, and those using 10 or fewer spoken words were randomly assigned to either the PRT training or the PECS training conditions. The quality of both interventions was shown to be very strong. Each child received about 14 hours of intense training per week, including extensive parent training. Measures were taken after six months of training and again three months after that. There will be many outcome measures analyzed as they try to determine whether there are child characteristics upon entry that help predict who will better respond to either approach. For now, let's simply focus on one outcome measure, the number of spoken words. In this slide, you can see the distribution across both groups six months after starting training in terms of the number of spoken words used. It's obvious that just as many children receiving PECS training produced just as many words as those children in the speech-oriented PRT program. You should also note that while some children in the PECS condition did not acquire any speech, the same was true for the PRT group. A question we think worthy of consideration for these children who acquire no speech after six months of intense training is this. Which is riskier, using a speech-alone approach or a PECS-alone approach? That is, if we try a speech-alone strategy and we see no speech after six months, then the child has acquired no functional communication skills. Every child in the PECS condition acquired skills associated with the first several phases of PECS, Thus, even the child in the PECS condition who showed no speech did show clear functional communication skills via PECS. Our recommendation? We do not believe this is truly an either-or situation. We would promote the immediate use of PECS coupled with a concerted effort to promote speech production, imitation skills, and other skills necessary for effective and fun functional use of speech. When this comprehensive study is finally published, we will post its description on our PECS.com website, so look for it coming soon. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Pyramid Educational Consultants offers many workshops regarding the use of PECS, including our two-day basic training and our two-day advanced PECS workshop, which provides opportunities to review and refine strategies and opportunities to plan for how to incorporate PECS use throughout the day and across functional settings. 
We also offer a PEC certification process. Details on this process can be viewed on our website or mailed directly to you. We also offer extended training on the pyramid approach and using the pyramid approach to set up a classroom. Other topics in our workshop series focus on how to teach critical communication skills, how to analyze and refine communication lessons guided by the analysis offered by B.F. Skinner, how to plan behavior intervention strategies, reviewing the language of emotions, and many others. Please check our website for which workshops are offered in your area, or contact us if you want to host one of your own. If you have questions about PECS use or implementation, there are many types of help available, including a PECS message board on which you can post your question. Furthermore, if you would like us to arrange for a workshop or consultation to your school, institution, or family, please contact our office directly. We'll be happy to tailor something to fit your specific needs. Thanks for joining us.